So tonight's speaker is Professor Cameron Poydell Pierce from Swansea University. Cameron is the Deputy Director of the Sustain Future Steelmaking Project, which is going to be the main topic of his talk with us tonight. He's also co-director of the Advanced Imaging Facility at Swansea. So I'll hand over to Cameron, I'll just pin him, and then he can uh, ask him to give tonight's presentation. Over to you, Cameron. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, thank you to all of you for, for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, enlighten those of you who don't have a lot of it or haven't already come across Sustain or, or, or heard anything about it, about what it is um, and, and what we're doing and, and how you might be able to contribute. We're always welcoming um, new people joining. Um, uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about how it is that it actually came to be and, and, and the, the challenges and, and opportunities that we had and came across as, as we went through that process. So, um, uh, Again, just as I'm uh, grabbing the presentation, um, I'd like to thank everybody again uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's nice to beam into everybody's uh, uh, studies, home offices, uh, kitchens, bedrooms or bathrooms, depending on means and preference. I, I really would prefer to, to, in a way, to be talking to you in, um, in July. Uh, when we might have the opportunity to actually meet face to face, um, but definitely looking forward to the, the opportunities to catch up with um, those of you who are on the line who I can't see, by the way, I don't know who's there, um, in, in the future as well. So, um, I always like to try and come up with some sort of a snappy title. Uh, so from nothing to now, so I'm going to try and talk through the program, um, how, where it came from, why we're doing it, um, and then uh, give you a what is unfortunately going to be a very high level overview um, because of the sheer breadth of the program uh, of, of the research activities that we're doing and the engagement activities that we're doing mainly to give you just an idea and some visibility of what of, of, of what the program is trying to achieve um, and then for you I suppose to identify opportunities where you might want to engage with the program in some way and we try to offer as many opportunities for people to do that um, as possible. Uh, so tell them what you're going to tell them. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about why the Sustain Manufacturing Hub, well, why we believe that it's important, um, how we did it. So the journey that, um, that we went on to actually develop the project, which is longer than you might expect. Um, who and what, so who's involved and what are they doing, um, and that will be covering the sustained engagement and research activities around how we're actually developing the network, outreach um, and, and skills uh, type activities and support, uh, and then some of the, the research um, focus around primary processing, emissions, emissions mitigation, recycling and reuse, process optimization and modelling, um, and product development, which is a very challenging thing to do for a program that is so large um, with so many different potential interests in different product areas involved. So I'll talk a little bit about that and, and offer up one potential solution, which isn't directly related to sustain or the activity that we work on specifically ourselves. And then I'll tell you what I've told you uh, following the, uh, the straightforward uh, motto. Um, so I guess, first of all, um, sustain is a word people would recognize, but it does stand for the Strategic Steel Technology and Innovation Network, Strategic University Steel Technology and Innovation Network. And, and the key, I guess, there is in the N. So in the, in the N, it's, it's really about us developing a wider network of activity. It's not a catch-all solution for the, for the issues of the steel industry by any stretch, because the, the sheer scale of the challenges uh, are just far too broad. Um, and again, the, the, the main focus of this presentation is really to provide you with uh, some visibility of what we do and opportunities for how you can join that network if, if you're not already somebody who's, who's participating in, in any way with the programme. So I think I think I first I said why. So why are we doing it? So the, the big we've got a series of UK crises, um, uh, which I guess many of us who are interested in materials and particularly materials uh, production that is energy intensive will know well. The first one is 
that we're offshoring and not decarbonizing. There's recent uh, changes to that to a degree. We are improving in, in, in this regard, um, but a lot of the emissions reduction that we're seeing or being measured are territorial emissions and unfortunately become offset with our consumption uh, of materials, of which steel is a very significant contributor um, that are generated and processed in other countries. Um, so we need to start taking responsibility for that. Um, and, and that's one big reason um, uh, to have a, a research network focused on steel. The second crisis that we have um, and we're in, even if we don't realize it yet, is an energy crisis. Um, so these are the wonderful um, diagrams produced by Grant Wilson. Um, this one's slightly more up to date than the usual slide that I put up. So you can kind of see a big drop off here where in our fuels. So this is just to say this is gas. So that's the cyclic seasonal demand. This is the electricity demand, which kind of peaks somewhat seasonally. Uh, oh, sorry. And then uh, this is the uh, transportation fuels, which you can see dropping off the cliff around April of last year. Um, isn't it a shame that we're actually a year or a year into that um, and still not out of it? Um, so herein lies the problem. Unfortunately, uh, electrification is kind of a byword for decarbonisation in many ways and a lot of the technologies that we're looking to develop or implement that might be commercially mature rely heavily on electrification. Um, similarly, we need to decarbonise domestic heating and space heating. That's the big blue variation in natural gas demand. So, and, and the peaks in that, for, for example, like the Beast for the East highlighted here, present significant challenges in doing that. So we need to take the blue one and add it to the red one. And then we need, we also want to electrify transport to decarbonize transport. And that means adding this one on as well. So um, there is some duplication there between the gas that's used for electricity generation um, and space heating. But nevertheless, this is a very good illustration of the challenge that we have. So we need to keep this in mind in terms of the, um, the, the solutions that we look for to try and decarbonize the steel industry. Um, but at the same time, um, we also uh, need to look at the steel industry as a potential solution to some of these problems uh, that has a lot of assets that we can use to try and solve, to try and solve this. The third one, if the first two weren't bad enough, is that we also have a consumption crisis and a waste crisis. Um, so there are many good studies which will approximately linearly correlate GDP to the amount of stuff that we dig out of the ground uh, and then consume. Um, and this is where we have a bit of a problem, especially in the UK, um, where we are importing quite a lot of energy intensive materials embodied in uh, goods and products. Um, and they get to an end of life in this country and then we have a challenge. Um, of course, we do attempt to do quite a lot of recycling these days, um, but even in that regard, you'll end up with these sorts of residual wastes, which is sort of highlighted over here on, on the right side of the screen, which is a kind of the everything else of what are at the moment considered to be non-valuable sources. And we've got some challenges of what we do with that. And of course, in some cases where we are looking to recycle stuff, we're still exporting that material. Um, and there's been a few relatively recent examples of where we're running into uh, problems with this, not least um, running up against the, the Chinese uh, National Sword Program, which has resulted in them taking less and less of our waste material away. So these are three crises for the whole of the UK economy that still can actually play a very significant role in solving. And so, there's some very good reasons there why we will want to, um, to, uh, to support innovation that helps us to use the assets that the steel industry has to, uh, to solve some of these wider societal challenges. And, and, and if, if that contribution wasn't good reason enough, there is also the issue of, of the uh, continued rise in demand for steel as a product as well. 
Uh, if you cast your eye down this this world steel chart on the right here, you, you can see that UK has one of the biggest discrepancies between its actual use of steel per capita and the generation or the capacity to generate steel per capita, which is in, which is interesting because um, we have a demand uh, for about 10 million tons um, of of raw uh, of, of raw material, steel raw material in the UK, which we produce a a percentage, but not all within the UK. We also then import about another 10 million tonnes embodied in products. And there's about another 10 million tonnes making its way between those products and um, either domestic recycling, which is unfortunately quite a small proportion of our valuable raw material that we have here in the UK, and then exporting, which is what happens to quite a lot of that material. So there's a lot of value there which we can take advantage of. And um, despite large economic events, so this one here is the global economic catastrophe of 2008, the demand for this product continues um, to increase, not least in the UK. And then finally, there's the community element. And this is probably, from my perspective, one of the most important things. So I was trying to find a way of describing what's kind of happened in the last 20 years of steel making within the UK. And it looks something like this. This is just a gift that I stole of, um, of the Big Bang. But basically what happened is we had a situation where we had quite a lot of critical mass and we had a very strong community. And then uh, especially over the last 20 years or so, that has split off um, into numerous smaller groups, smaller companies, smaller research groups. Um, and generally with less critical mass. And you have to ask yourself the question, if it wasn't for the societies like the SMEA um, uh, and, and other technical groupings, where would we be as a community if it weren't for that? So that was another strong reason to do that. I'm not quite sure where I dropped this other image in, but this is basically discrete element modeling. So I was gonna say that the steel industry has some experience of being able to track these particles, but from a social perspective, it becomes quite difficult. So trying to unite the whole of the industry behind a common agenda uh, and, and look for those commonalities between what have now become discrete businesses and also discrete um, research support functions was a really important goal of sustain in trying to build the, uh, bring the community back together. So then how did it happen? Well, uh, in the last, five years I suppose it's taken us five or six years has taken us to get to this to this stage so it all kind of started around 2015-16 where there was what I call the steel crisis uh, perhaps because I'm uh, somewhat baby-faced compared to some of my uh, my uh, colleagues especially from the industrial perspective who have seen the ebbs and flows of and trials and tribulations of the steel industry over a much longer period of time and they would probably call it a, a steel crisis rather than the steel crisis but nevertheless there was a crisis within the UK um, that led to the breakup um, particularly of Tata Steel um, uh, but then a diversification and, and new players coming in and, and, and new industrial um, uh, companies with new cultures with new priorities um, and so that, that in itself presented a challenge. What came out of that though was really positive. So there was a lot of good interaction between the different um, uh, major steel producers in the UK um, looking uh, amongst other sector deals that were being announced at the time to try and push UK government to develop a sector deal. And as part of that, they developed quite a lot of technical commonalities as well as obviously um, uh, common requirements from a from a policy and economic um, fiscal policy perspective um, uh, what that did is in the support community uh, and I had personal experience of this what it did is it, people began to smell the money and that's great uh, and what happened was we started to generate individually and I would include where I'm from so the sort of South Wales area in this there was a lot of locally driven, driven initiatives which were probably more silent than they than they should or could have been, um, looking to try and support industry um, in their local clusters. Um, and what that meant was, is there was a lot of different asks, a lot of different things going in and, and, and the potential, I suppose, for conflict amongst the community that was already quite um, disparate 
um, in the first place compared compared to where we would have been, um, say, in the two thousand in the early two thousands. Um, and then uh, around uh, around about that time when we were trying to pull all these different things together, this opportunity came up. So EPSRC uh, launched a call for what they call uh, one of their manufacturing hubs, future manufacturing hubs. Now, future manufacturing hubs are seven year programs. Um, they're the largest critical mass investment that EPSRC, who, if you're not familiar, I should say, are the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. So a branch of UKRI that fund, fund fundamental research in the area of, um, of the physical sciences, engineering and physical sciences. And they launched, um, I think at that point it was their third, I think, I believe their third or fourth um, call for manufacturing hubs. And they fund, uh, and these are open calls. So they basically go out to the entire manufacturing community and say, give us your best shot for what you think deserves funding over every other thing that could be funded across the UK, any other sector that could be supported. And, and to give you a flavour, there's a there's a vaccines hub, which of course you might expect has been very busy recently. Uh, and from the material side, there's a composites hub. There's a hub supporting mostly light alloy development, the liquid metal engineering hub uh, out of Brunel. There's the map hub at Sheffield, which I guess many of you would be familiar with um, in powder processing. Um, just as a flavour, uh, semiconductors, um, advanced crystallisation, um, photonics, a whole range of different areas. Uh, and to me, I thought, well, why not? Um, and the great thing about this is it links very, very well with the SMEA because the pivotal point was um, 2017, which I believe was John Spears, um, uh, when John Spear was Bessemer Laureate. Um, and the dinner afterwards at Cutler's Hall, um, I decided I'm going to go around and I'm going to pitch this to everybody because it was Bessemer Day and everybody who kind of needed to be there from an academic perspective or an industrial perspective was there to try and sound them out. Um, and that just shows the power of that event because I wonder whether if I wasn't there, it, if, if, if that event hadn't been organised, if you hadn't hosted it, would I have even got um, to, the, to the stage of actually um, uh, making sustain a reality. So uh, we spent a little bit of time pitching it to lots of different people there at the time uh, and then subsequently we spent quite a lot of time doing coordination and engagement across the different parties because we started with the stuff that we had out of the sector deal the technical priorities that we had uh, out of the sector deal um, unfortunately I think maybe by then uh, definitively unsuccessful so se sector deal proposal but nevertheless, we started with that and we said, right, how do we develop a tangible, um, fundamentally driven uh, cross-cutting research agenda to support the steel industry? And of course, there are many more things that you can do than you can even fit into the largest critical mass investment funded by EPSRC. Um, so there was a lot of work that went on where academics were pitching in ideas. Um, and then industry was saying, we like this, we don't like that. And we went through a ranking procedure and eventually got to a stage where we started to condense the, the, the research priorities um, for the project. And in the background, there's a process to go through. So you, you, you don't simply just write something down and send it into EPSRC and get these things funded. You have to do a lot of engagement with the funder. Um, then they go through what's called an outline process where you write a, a much more condensed uh, proposal. And I think at that stage, Steel went in against 32 other different potential opportunities to support with a manufacturing hub, considering that broad remit, considering all of those things in the context of UK manufacturing that could have been supported. And there was a really interesting discussion around this time, or a kind of a almost like a crisis of confidence, where we asked ourselves the question, does the community want, would it actually be willing to fund something on steel? Because of course, steel making, unfortunately still has, or, or, especially at the time, had a, the perception of kind of maybe being a backward looking industry or not a particularly innovative industry. We all know that not to be the case, but nevertheless, we have to accept that that is the view from certain quarters and perhaps not particularly science advanced. And we thought, or do we want to water this down? Do we want to make this look more broad? Perhaps it's steel and other metals. Um, but we just decided this is what we want. 
we've got this far and we've already talking now maybe two years of effort on behalf of multiple partners even if it wasn't instantly coordinated no let's do what we want let's ask for what we want and we went into that 30 um into that batch of 30 proposals at the outline stage and were one of the nine selected of those nine selected we then asked to write the full proposal which is where all of that detail went in from the pre-competitive research agenda and our plans for how we were going to deliver impact on the program and then of those nine they invited six to interview we were lucky to be one of those six um, and then of those six that they interviewed they funded two and we were one of those two proposals so we found out that was at the beginning I believe of November and by the end of November we were uh, informed uh, unofficially that um, that we've been successful so up against very very stiff I think the important thing to say this isn't a backslapping thing the important thing to say here is that up against very stiff competition across multiple different sectors that might appear more sexy or scientifically advanced still had a very strong case remembering that EPSRC proposals are not really funded on the basis of anything political. It, you're assessed by your peers on your scientific quality and your ability to deliver impact in the areas that you're looking at. So, you know, if anybody still has that crisis of confidence, I say, look at this and say, that's a reason why you should always go exactly for what you want, um, because that will generate uh, I hope the best proposal and a successful outcome for whatever it is that you want to do. Don't second think what it is that you think the community will want. So then we finally got to the position where we were going to start and that is in April um, 2019 after a lot of pre-financial checks and all that sort of stuff. So we launched a programme in 2019 and I spent quite a lot of time talking about this but that's probably the part of, of these sorts of proposal development that a lot of people don't see and I thought it was worthwhile people having some view as, as to how it developed. So we got the proposal. What does it look like? Um, so in, I, I guess all this maybe should be what did it look like? Um, because we've built on this significantly. Um, we have two, there's a short, there's some acronyms in here, which I'll demystify. We have two grand challenge research areas. And then we had a series of um, of, uh, of of companies who, who we engage at the initial stages of the program or the, or, or the proposal development of the program. So our first grand challenge research area, GCRA, was um, uh, carbon neutral iron and steel making. So that's really about, well, how do you develop a sustainable platform on which you can produce steel um, within the UK? Um, and there are multiple different ways, of course, um, uh, to do that and the second grand challenge research area is in smart steel processing so very high level um, and you might say well that encompasses almost everything to do with steel um, but nevertheless those are the two areas um, that we looked to generate those those fed into the priorities and the research priorities that we that we look to do and I'll give you some more information about that in a second the hub based at Swansea but this is a very um, collaborative program um, where all three parties uh, when well, we had meetings just today just this morning uh, sit and discuss um, different elements of the program and coordinate together between the universities of Sheffield and Warwick and, and I'll come to show you later uh, increasing numbers of universities across the UK as well from a fundamental research perspective then we engage several key innovation partners um, uh, Henry Royce Institute, um, many different branches of the high value manufacturing catapult, uh, the Materials Processing Institute is a key partner, um, and of course uh, UK Steel. And, it, and in addition to that, some of the other um, those some of the other technology supply companies and material supply companies that sit within the supply chain as well. So this is underpinned by some key values. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but I mean, the main points that I want to emphasize because it's important for you in the community is that collaboration is really, really important. And also responsible innovation and career development is also really, really important to us as well. Um, and hopefully that will come through when we come to talk about the engagement aspects. 
So the network nucleus looks something like this. When I say the nucleus, this is kind of how we started. And then the intention was always to build beyond this. So this wasn't the be all and end all of research support for steel. It was going to be very difficult to coordinate that with the large number of potential contributors that there would be across the whole of the UK. But this was just the start. Um, so we have Swansea in the centre, Sheffield um, Materials Processing Institute and the Advanced Steel Research Centre at Warwick University um, there in the research orbit. We then got a series of um, innovation partners who we work with in key areas supporting the steel industry. Um, and then from an engagement perspective, a whole series of the key trade bodies um, representing some of the key sectors for, for steel um, across the UK and critically, uh, the workforce um, as well. And this has expanded. So what we've done is we funded uh, feasibility studies um, and we've issued our own calls to try and attract more university partners um, in. Uh, and so far that includes Durham, uh, Cardiff and UCL. And I'll give you some highlights of how they're contributing to the programme in a second. But then that's not the, the limit of the programme. Well, then we want to be looking to how we can engage a much wider range of people across the whole of the UK. Um, and we finally got to the, the, the point of organising some events. This is an event that we ran in the Royal Society, clearly pre-pandemic. Um, and then we kind of got COVID uh, affected by, by COVID, just like everybody else, and then continued to run similar types of um, events and engagement activities, albeit um, uh, not in person. Uh, we continue to expand that as well. So some of you might have seen that very recently the Transforming Foundation Industries Network Plus, also funded by the EPSRC, has also recently launched and will be running its first workshop um, towards the end of April and also um, issuing its own calls as well. Um, so uh, we will be working, I work on both of those two programmes, so we'll be working very, very closely together between those two networks to engage not only um, the network specific to steel manufacturing in the UK, but also the, exploiting those opportunities for, for cross-sector collaboration across the different foundation industries or producers of uh, high energy intensive industries. So in addition to that, um, we also run a whole series of, of, of outreach events as well. Um, so we collaborate heavily with, for example, Discover Materials, which is a national program looking at how we can get children um, and, and potential stu university students um, to understand the benefits of, of studying materials at university, um, because we really have a challenge um, in terms of the numbers of graduates that are available with those sorts of expertise to support our industries across the UK. Um, we recognise and sustain that we might be able to produce um, some, some novel technologies, but unless you have a good um, stock of people coming through who have the knowledge and expertise to be able to, to run them um, or, new, or develop new products or manage the new products, then, then this is essentially um, futile. So uh, there's just a few examples here, but things include um, sort of larger national events like the Materials Research Exchange. Um, we helped to coordinate um, the recent Bessemer Masterclass. We've engaged with the IOM3 on the Steel Strategy Seminars. Um, and we intend to continue to do that. Uh, we'll be uh, supporting the uh, European Electric Steelmaking Conference with a, with a workshop there. Um, various different uh, national um, science festivals and we'll be running some of our own uh, seminars as well. So um, if you check our, our website sustainedsteel.ac.uk uh, um, you can uh, see all of the recent events that are coming up and see how you guys um, can get involved if that's what you want to do. This feeds very nicely into our skills delivery requirements. So again What's the point in producing novel technologies if you then don't have a good strong bedrock of people to help you implement and deliver them? Uh, and to this end, whilst we don't have large amounts of resources devoted to skills, we do are interacting with some aligned programs. So just as an example, we have one 
in Swansea University uh, called the Materials Academy, which looks at how you can bring people through from work-based learning. So this is what they call their triangle of training from work-based learning, where you might take one or two courses that relate very specifically to, to the job that you're doing within um, a particular manufacturing line. But then you can build that up and you can get to a point via accumulation of credits, if that's what you want to do by building expertise to get to the point where you can actually um, qualify to go into a part time degree. Or, of course, you can go into degree schemes in, in the way that you would do that conventionally. But it's about in trying to improve um, access for, for different routes in, in, into this um, progression. And then you could step out there and go into a graduate job or you could look at trying to do um, a full or a part time master's uh, degree. And then ultimately, of course, you could end up doing a, a PhD or an NGD and the numbers of people who, who head, head to who, who, who get to the top of this um, triangle will probably be less. Um, but nevertheless, they're all important routes in terms of delivering um, experts in, into the field to try and support the businesses. And more broadly, uh, so that's a, a delivery vehicle. And then more broadly, of course, we're looking to try and feed our and consider any of our research outputs in the context of what that means for the for the future direction of skills. And one particularly strong collaboration, which we're which we're um, pulling together at the moment, is with the European uh, Steel Skills Agenda um, project, uh, which is really uh, a, a really useful collaboration to have. We're associate members of that program. Um, and and actually have found that that they could really do this is a little bit of a plug for them they could really do with more more information from from the domestic UK uh, producers in terms of skills requirements feeding into that but they've got some really interesting reports and things that we consider and, and contribute to from the sustain um, program which leaves me a little bit of time <laughs> to talk about um, the research program again it's going to be very difficult for me to do this justice and and any of the individual research um, uh, leaders for these different programs will probably uh, not be not feel that I'm doing any one of them any any justice particularly but I'll just try to give you an overview of, of what we do and, and why so uh, again we have these two grand challenge research areas and the first one this carbon neutral iron and steel making is really about developing that um, uh, sustainable bedrock for the industry moving forward and of course we know there's numerous different ways you can try and tackle this probably there will be some emissions to air and we need to think about how do we um how do we manage those and certainly um in the shorter term and of course we need to look at our in energy demand as well so how do we make our processes primarily in the case of steel and many of the other foundation industries as well uh, more thermally efficient it's a real important uh, big win there and then of course we need to say right well if we can do that if we can mitigate some of our emissions from the primary end of the processing and make our processes more efficient how do we make best use of the materials and then somewhere in between that uh, linking that to the to the new processes that we have to adopt there's going to be a key series of, of in, informatics um, uh, industrial informatics activity that you're going to need to do and basis that you need to have so big data industry for call it what you will and I noticed that Chris McDonald had presented to you um, relatively recently on that this year so you know I won't cover that in a lot of detail here and then the development of the future processes. So once you've got that sustainable bedrock, once you have those key transferable skills and, 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 and technology developments, how do you harness that to take it forward to make the products more competitive? You'll notice here that there's not a lot on product and that's because product is hard uh, because all of the industries across the UK are essentially non-competitive. If you look at the different companies with, a very, with very few exceptions, um, tend not to compete directly in different product forms. And that makes it difficult to build a program around product development that is pre-competitive um, and fundamental in nature. But we gave it our best shot and we'll cover that in a second. This is all underpinned by platform activity and, and we made a conscious decision to, to make this focused on early career researchers. So we've just completed and I wish if I was probably one day later presenting one day later, I might be able to provide you with more information about this, but the applicants don't yet know. We have made a decision uh, to fund some ECRs from a recent call which we released. Um, uh, and that's really exciting for me because it gives them the opportunity to develop their own research independence and hopefully the future leaders um, for the industry as well. 
And this breaks down into five themes, which I won't go over because you can see them on the screen. And then within that, um, at the moment, uh, well, nine tasks are presented and I haven't actually included the, the feasibility studies or the ECR activity, which we can include on that as well. So that's going to be more like 15 or 16. So there's a lot going on. So we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. And again, unfortunately, I'm going to have to blast through it pretty quick, um, but just to give you an idea. So you've got two options for fundamental, for, 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 uh, um, for primary processing, you either electrify the process and you go down the EAF route, um, or you, you produce uh, virgin iron, and then perhaps the happy medium is somewhere in the middle. There's a lot of work going on both within Stain and in, at Sustain and in other programs as well, looking at what the opportunities are to go to 100% scrap and whether that maybe that is the best route. We're agnostic about it, but what's interesting about it is that if you look at all of the alternative iron making technologies which are out there, some of which are listed here, the vast majority, with the exception of the oxide electrolysis methods, require some sort of carbon source. And in fact, the EAF, of course, requires a carbon source too. So one of the things that Sustain is looking at is using um, this uh, residual waste, which I pointed to earlier on in the presentation, and seeing how this can be used uh, or employed as a as a reductant in in these processes. So either by in our case we're looking at EAF or, or blast furnace, but this of course uh, the learnings from this could equally be applied to to these other processes, um, as well. So this is kind of a materials from waste rather than an energy from waste argument. Um, there's a lot of interesting challenges here. So this work is being conducted by Peter Holloman at Swansea University and Julian Steer, who was funded by one of our feasibility studies at Cardiff University. Um, and they're looking at some real ultra fast kinetics, the sort of thing that simulates the activity that you would get in the raceway of the blast furnace. So pyrolysis events at millisecond, uh, at millisecond intervals and, and measuring very, very fast what happens to these materials, both from a chemical perspective um, and, and also from a, from a kinetic perspective as well. And this is interesting because these materials, um, they're actually composites of both plastics and paper. I would acknowledge if anybody has highlighted it, I can't see the chat and if I did, I, I get too confused. Um, the, the Japan has been doing this for a long time, but they've been doing it on 100% plastic. So they've been solving this problem at the sorting. Unfortunately, in the UK, we have a historical problem where we've just got a lot of material that isn't particularly well sorted. Uh, and this is one potential solution to that, which is also being considered for energy from waste. From an emissions mitigation perspective, we have, uh, we, we're focusing within Sustain on uh, carbon capture and utilisation as opposed to carbon capture and storage. The main reason for this is that um, uh, although this seems like a ubiquitous challenge to all industry and maybe not something that's specific to steel, we've realised in the development of the programme that we have to look specifically at the gas streams related to certain processes that you get um, that are very have very specific signatures for steel. Um, and in, in using that, we're really interested in, well, what would the business model look like? How do we turn carbon not into a problem that we have to bury, but into a resource which we can harness? into a positive um, rather than a perceived negative. And this work has been done across Sheffield and Swansea universities with Peter Starring at Sheffield, Enrico Andrioli and Andrew Barron at Swansea University. And they're kind of looking at two parallel processes. So one is a sort of a pressure swing type reaction um, at Sheffield, thermally driven, um, looking at trying to produce dimethyl ether as a substitute for, for aerospace fuels. So a contribution to the decarbonisation of transport. Uh, and the steel industry simultaneously. And at Swansea, they're looking at trying to produce ethylene uh, through electrical driven uh, catalytic type um, processes. Then we have the issue of the actual metals production itself. So once you've got it, how do you purify it? So they sort of later stage processes, uh, secondary steel making and casting in particular. Ideally, we want to try and step away from the linear economy. OK, this is the big solution. So the long term solution is that we reuse, we maintain, we redistribute uh, or remanufacture as opposed to recycle. Uh, and the reason for that is kind of this diagram on the right where you can see that this is a variety of different processes. But if you look at steelmaking in particular, we trap quite a lot of high value elements in, um, in the slag 
when we do this, when we purify these materials, and there's probably better ways of managing this material stream to try and avoid doing this. Nevertheless, there are some things which are kind of baked into our supply chain, which without significant differences in the way that we process this raw material are going to come through and hit us in the products. The problem with this is, is that we've been very, very good in steel at producing new products uh, with tighter and tighter pro um, process tolerances and better and better performance. What that means is we've actually made ourselves more and more susceptible to the challenges of increasing volumes of residuals coming through the supply chain, which we will have as we start to decarbonize uh, the supply chain. Um, so uh, one of the ways that we're looking at this is, well, if it ends up in there, what do you do and how do you manage it? And that work has been conducted by Zushi Lee at Warwick University. And he's looking at the impact of, of, of some of these. Um, he's already done a lot of work looking at what the future viability of the steel production cycle looks like and what sort of materials we have coming into the industry, coming down the track. And now it's well, once you pick those out, particularly copper, tin, uh, zinc, uh, and those ones that were going to be increasingly important when we come to electrification, how you manage that through the process. So what can you do in, in the casting uh, stages in particular um, to try and mitigate um, some of these effects? We're doing a lot of work then sort of moving on from Grand Challenge Research Area 1 to Grand Challenge Research Area 2 on process optimization. So we're looking at the development of, of technologies, yes, but also critically the process and supply chain modelling. Uh, we need to look at well, what are the flexible critical parameters that we can use and that we can target with models or technologies. And I guess for, for the steel industry and many other foundation industries, there's no more critical parameter than temperature. Okay, so one of the areas of work that I'm personally involved in, rather than in, in addition to sort of overseeing the, 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 the whole program, is in um, thermal efficiency. And there's lots of different angles to this, which are really, really interesting. Uh, so there's work on burner efficiency, which has been done by Yuk and Hu out of uh, UCL. That's some really interesting um, work there uh, on uh, looking at how you can go for new uh, fuel uh, contributions and what that means purely from a thermal perspective. So he's looking at a lot of the, the modeling of that um, activity to try and predict what we're going to get. Um, there's a lot of work going on with Matthew Carney, who works out of the uh, specific uh, Knowledge Innovation Center and in Swansea University at Thermoelectrics, and they've developed novel 3D printed um, type systems and cast systems, which you can then implement in much more. At the moment, all of these devices tend to be kind of flat and hard. And what we're looking at doing is how do you implement them into more harsh environments? Um, how can they operate at higher temperatures? And then how do you integrate them better into say thermal linings? That's where I come in. I'm doing quite a lot of research here. This is an X-ray CT um, through thickness scan um, of a refractory material. So we're looking at the behavior of these different refractory materials um, and how, uh, and there's some interesting interdependencies there between say, for example, what happens when you go for fuel switching and what does that mean for the behavior of refractories? And, and again, this is within, with, in collaboration with some key supply chain um, partners within the UK, like Vesuvius. And this is being supported to an increasing degree by some excellent work, which has been done by John Wilmot, who um, isn't yet formally um, part of Sustain, but uh, really has some useful contributions to make, I think, for, for steel making and lots of other energy intensive industries and some of the real creative stuff um, that he's doing um, around high resolution uh, thermal imaging and thermal metrology of processes uh, and, and recently looking to extend that into, into chemical metrology as well. So some really interesting stuff there. So that's a key parameter and some key process optimization energy reduction strategies that we're looking to try and um, develop. But from a process modeling perspective, the real jewel in the crown at the moment, which um, I'm assuming that Chris would have highlighted to you earlier on, is this interface between physics-based modeling. So conventional physics-based modeling as an example of that, uh, some solidification, physics-based solidification modeling on the left and data-driven modeling. So the stuff that we write with the physics, uh, the fundamental physical laws um, that we believe accurately simulate the process and the approach where you just look at as much data as possible, try to get a very good picture, learn from that data what the correlations are between the process parameters and the outputs um, 
even though it doesn't understand anything about what's actually happening in the process and there are no physical laws in there. They both have advantages and disadvantages and a lot of the really interesting work going on in this space, again, people might call it broadly industry four, is about well, how do you address the interface between the physics-based modeling and the data-driven modeling. And that's really exciting. From a data-driven perspective of InSustain, we have the Digital uh, Steel Innovation Cluster or the Digital Steel Innovation Hub. I think they're uh, more better known by now. Um, so this is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, collaboration within Sustain uh, between data scientists like Giovanni Montana at Warwick, uh, computer scientists like Arnold Beckman at Swansea, uh, Janet Godsell at Warwick, who is um, a supply chain expert, and, and at the big, uh, and Jonathan Linton at Sheffield University, who, who looks at sort of innovation management styles. And, and this is really interesting because um, there's some real interesting touch points going on within the program at the moment about, well, we've got the data driven model. So how are we going to be able to use artificial neural networks, um, artificial intelligence to be able to uh, Im improve our prediction of the process? But then increasingly looking at, well, what does that mean from a supply chain perspective? So, and again, this is about producing a better offering for, for customers and, 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 and in key downstream sectors for steel. Because if we're able to predict better what's going to happen to the material, yes, we're able to improve product quality, but we're also able to a degree to give a lot more information potentially to the customers of the steel industry about exactly what it is that they're getting. And that matters to people who work in press shops, that matters to people who design buildings and want to know about the asset integrity there. Uh, it matters to people who design, say, deep sea pipeline or, or, or transmission activity, uh, because they want to know what's going to happen to that through the life of it as well. And if we can give much more specific information by having better predictive capability and processing, then it gives us the opportunity if we can trace the material, if we can use the computer science technologies to be able to undeniably trace material through its life cycle, to pull that supply chain closer together, provide better value for the customer and uh, a better solution for the steel industry as well. And that's really interesting from a data-driven perspective. And then from a physics model perspective, it's well, we have lots and lots of work that's already been done on physics-based models. How do we use that in a more efficient way? So both Richard Thackeray and Michael Anger are working on, uh, actively working at the moment on, on both LCA and more elegant mathematical approaches to addressing uh, these, these, um, these challenges so that we can uh, try to speed up or make these models more reactive. So what you tend to find with the, um, uh, the physics-based models is they don't need a lot of data to train them because they're driven by the physical laws but they can be very computationally intensive and not necessarily give you something which is going to be useful or from a production line perspective or, or feed through that information. So as they start to develop this more and interact more with the guys who are working in the Digital Steel Innovation Hub, we're hoping we're going to be able to pull that gap or close that gap. Um, and, and of course, necessarily, this is going to be within quite a limited remit for uh, the uh, given the wide range of different potential areas that you could look at all the way through. Um, the steel production process, but we're spinning out all of the time into new activities, complementary activities, um, and, and we've been doing a lot of work with other manufacturing hubs recently to try and um, see what uh, specific research we can do on how mathematically you link these data-driven and physics-based approaches, um, and if that, that bid comes off, we'll be able to tell you more about that in the future. Crap in, crap out, uh, excuse my French, is the, uh, is, is the maxim for modelling. So we're also looking at trying to develop uh, novel sensor technologies. Um, two areas that we're looking at particularly at the moment are one, again, telling us more about what's the material that we've actually produced. How can we use that to feed forward through the process? And there's some really interesting work being done by Claire Davis at Warwick University. Um, not only developing electromagnetic sensors that can tell us what's happening to the microstructure of the material without us having to sample it, but also then feeding that forward to heat treatment capabilities and looking at how you can measure something and then perhaps tailor the heat treatment cycles that you have as a function of the microstructures that you're generating, whether they were on target or not. And of course, the potential to interact with the hub, the digital hub, and see how we can feed some of that information through to the customer and whether there is value there. 
and then also really interesting uh, work that is that's going to dovetail nicely into the, our work on thermal efficiency is some work that's being completed by Alton Horsfield, Horsfall, sorry, and Andrew Gallant at, um, at Durham University. I had a catch up with them this morning. Really interesting work, and they're looking at novel semiconductor metrology uh, technologies to look at electrical um, components that can support high temperature metrology so that we again can get better inputs into our e either our data driven our physics based or ideally our combination of data driven and physics based models to improve um, the steel making process and then last but not least we're having a go at product development and this is an interesting one. I think Mark and, and, and Eric from, from Sheffield really went through the ringer on this program and it took us quite a while uh, to get to a point where we were, get, we were able to pull together a detailed, um, uh, fundament, fundament, fundamentally scientifically justified piece of work that also um, delivered on the interests of multiple different um, uh, businesses with multiple different products. And, and ultimately, the, the solution to this was just to get very, very fundamental. So they're both looking at the, do, at the level of austenite conditioning, how you can stabilize or otherwise uh, austenite, what that means in terms of hardenability and potential for strain partitioning um, thereafter. But again, without getting into too much detail. But there are other things that you can do. Um, that don't necessarily that, that allow you to maybe tailor things to particular products it's not something that sustain is ever going to be able to do just because it's very difficult once you get closer and closer and closer to a specific chemistry you become less and less bilateral and more and more unilateral just a quick plug for another program that i'm involved in so there's a rapid alloy prototyping program also funded by epsrc this is a prosperity partnership type program um, with tata steel supported by Swansea University and Warwick University. And this is where we're looking at trying to set up um, experimentally and computationally um, rapid alloy prototyping approaches that allow us to try and short circuit the development cycle. This is particularly interesting because um, not only do we of course want to be generating more and more, uh, uh, more and more competitive products, but we also want to be able to do that at very high yield and also take account of the fact that a lot of our development, as I mentioned earlier on, a lot of our development is really narrowing down our opportunity for sustainability because we've got to a point where we're producing very, very specialist products with very, very small um, uh, process windows. Uh, and the idea of this is that um, you'll be able to manage that process better as we have to try and tailor the changes in alloy composition that might come along as we change our primary production methods and potentially encounter more residuals in the process. So we've developed a different, a, a series of different, um, from a laboratory perspective, a series of different uh, um, rapid alloy prototyping approaches from very, very small at the 20 to 40 gram area, which is sort of um, induction melting of powders to 200 grams, which for that lab is big, uh, with um, a centrifugal casting, and then uh, two to five kilo process, which is being developed at Warwick University, and a, uh, a more conventional uh, 20 to 30 kilo uh, lab rolling type process uh, that we might be more used to from a product development perspective and try to compare and contrast how you can go at that. And I think this is a really interesting, exciting project and something that offers up opportunities for product development programs. Um, although naturally, I think they're always going to be focused more to one, one or maybe two um, uh, steelmaking partners. So I guess the upshot of that is we're doing our best to try and satisfy fundam fundamental uh, metallurgical processes. Um, and product development but it's very very difficult to do that in a way that satisfies the requirements of multiple different steel industry partners uh, industry partners across the uk so i think i've rabbited on for long enough in summary sustain is a nucleus it's just a start it's not the be all and end all of steel innovation in the uk or fundamental research in the UK. And we've always recognized that there are many more people doing many more weird, wonderful and transformative things across the UK at academic base. But what it does do is hopefully start to bring those people together. We're always open 
um, to new collaborations and we'll do our very best to support that either through our own funding that we can distribute um, or just through helping to make connections from within the network. It's still growing fast and we want it to continue to grow. So if you have any interest, or you want to get involved in the in the program or know more, please do email us at info at Sustain Steel um, or, or contact the SMEA and I'll be happy to provide some forwarding information to them. Collaboration and integration with the whole uh, of the UK um, community is really, really important to us. And we're looking to support and develop new opportunities. So far, we've, we've helped to leverage 15 million in aligned EPSRC programmes and fundamental research. That's in the first two years. We've engaged 300 new academic and industrial partners. And we've run two funding calls for the benefit of the wider community. We want to continue to support you and the UK industry uh, to come together uh, and thrive. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I can see lots of things flashing on my screen, which I suppose means there might be some questions. Well, thank you very much, Cameron, for that uh, very in-depth or big, a big overview of a big project by the sounds of it. Um, it's a lot, a lot to manage. <laughs> yes. Um, we've Oh, not that many questions in so far. If people would like to ask questions, can I please ask them to use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom? The first question which we have is from Henry. Henry tends to ask questions quite regularly at this event. Um, how, how can we maintain a realistic cost for steel using sustainable production? Uh a good question that the answer is is very multi-dimensional so i think that they're, 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 they're uh, or multifaceted i suppose is is the solution so it's going to be very difficult to say uh, implement an off the off the shelf technology so if you look at say carbon capture storage that's maybe 50 ton 50 50 pounds per ton uh, of co2 um per ton of steel something like that uh so you know that's a hell of a lot to add on to hot roll coil price although uh, that in itself has gone a little bit weird and does actually vary from market forces more than that um, but simply adding that on and then not having that done in a unilateral fashion across the whole of the, the, the potential global supply presents very significant challenges so of course there's a very important role of policy um, uh, and certainly something that tackles carbon embodied in trade and I know that the EU in particular are, are very a, a kind of a lot further down the track than perhaps other economies in terms of addressing carbon embodied in trade. I think that's going to be important. And, and I think the other thing to, to identify or, or look for, especially in the new technologies that we're looking to develop is, well, what other business opportunities exist as a result of uh, implementing those decarbonisation technologies? So if you look at the many of the strategies that exist around, say, emissions mitigation it's clustering so it's looking at well if you're going to have large point and this is where steel actually has an advantage because it's a very large point source emitter of co2 so the business model for, for steel production there actually looks quite good and you do have the potential then to build an infrastructure around say a steel plant that lots of other industries can benefit from as well and that might lessen the burden of the investment and the maintenance and operational costs um, associated with some of these decarbonisation technologies so policy plays a really important part, um, but we should also look at opportunities across sectors um, for, uh, and, you know, I guess the, the broad term is industrial symbiosis, opportunities for industrial symbiosis, where we can improve the business models um, for, uh, for implementing some of these decarbonisation technologies. Well, thank you very much, Cameron. So if anyone else has got any more questions, please put them into the Q&A function. Since we haven't got any more, I'll ask one myself. Also, there are, most of the steel production in the UK at the moment, volume wise, is done through the traditional blast furnace production route and very, very, well, relatively small tonnage is done through the arc furnace route. But quite a number of the products that are made in the UK could be made by the arc furnace route. What do you think is actually stopping people investing in lower carbon technologies at this point in time, the technologies that exist already that are Deemed to be a lower carbon than bus furnace. Um, uh, that's a good question. I, I think there's a I think if you look at the 
the the capex requirements for any investment in new in new steel technology uh, or, or new processes there's there's a there's a lot there that you have to do um, uh, from the perspective of uh, the investments that are involved and at the moment the the climate for investment as I, is it in the UK is I suppose uncertain I, I think it's highly likely that that um, when those investments occur they are going to be in the air in those areas and i think you you are likely to see a rebalancing between between blast furnace and let's call them other technologies um or electric steel making for example so i think you are likely to see an improvement in the balance of that but there's a lot of other things that go around an eaf and simply um transforming say the i.e. mills, annealing furnaces, all of these sorts of things. Uh, so I think if you uh, look at the, the, the challenges of, say, tran of, of, of transitioning the existing sites, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there and, and, and some potential uncertainty on the best route as a function of the investment environment and the policy uh, trajectory in the UK moving forwards. Okay. Um, wait, oh, uh, Mark Tomlinson's just put a question in the chat. Um, okay. So, um, Mark says, there will be more contribution to sustainability from scientific or data handling? Well, sorry, will there be more? Do you think there will be more contribution to sustainability from sort of how we manage data and uh, scientific uh, information rather than the actual Pro process themselves, changing processes, but actually managing the processes we already know better. Um, I, I think we're probably in the area of marginal gains in terms of managing the processes that we already have better. Um, but in terms of the ability of data to um, manage, in, in terms of the ability of data to help us disrupt entire supply chains i think that's a very different proposition so there is the potential you can see in terms of de the, the real route to decarbonization is to use less material yeah because there's always going to be a carbon footprint associated with the materials production and the value of data in in potentially disrupting the supply chains to the degree that we are able to use the materials that we already have circulating around the economy more efficiently i think could be the big game changer um, for decarbonization but we have to recognize um uh, from a process uh modeling perspective that there's already a lot of good work that's already been done and a lot of efficiency improvements that have been made on the existing processes okay that's one um, i'd like to ask is do you think there's much mileage in um, looking at how the product is comes back into the supply chain from a steel making point of view? Obviously, a lot of technologies are looking at using more scrap. Scrap seems to be a relatively uh, unknown material. Do you think there's big advantages there being able to use more scrap and not have these uh, concerns about residuals if we were able to somehow integrate the the life cycle part of the use into the supply chain of steel yeah um absolutely so um in terms of if you want to call it the recycling side of that there's there's work that we're doing at the moment trying to pull together um the, the different suppliers uh of of scrap and and the steel businesses which in itself presents its own challenges i suppose um uh, and looking at how you can make that supply chain work better uh, not only for the benefit of steel but also for the benefit of, of other sectors that see material flows through those same channels that are of use um, whether that's the sort of the precious metals or glass or even polymers for example if you, if you take for example the, the auto the flow of material coming through automotive um, so I, I think there's significant advantages to doing that and then at the more blue sky disruptive end of the spectrum, there's steel as a service, 
which probably is an entirely other talk. <laughs> it would take quite some time to get through. Um, but uh, the, you you could take that to the nth degree and say, well, that's just the recycling element, but how, how does a steel company become more invested in the material all the way through its life cycle? How does it keep tabs on that material? And of course, if we know where it's going, what it's doing, not only can we provide more value to the customers, but we can also intrinsically retain more value in terms of our eventual recycling of that material if it came to that. But that really should be our our worst case, you know, or our or our option of last resort. And there are plenty of opportunities that could support strong economic growth around managing the material through its life cycle that steel companies don't currently get involved in. And that is something working with a variety of different sectors at the moment from a conceptual point of view of, of, of what the roadmap to steel as a service would look like and whether uh, to leave you with this one, ultimately you would consider leasing a material rather than selling it. Okay, I think we'll take one last question, which is from Peter. Um, you said obviously talked about this project being just a start in Tokyo sustainable steel manufacturing in, in the UK. Uh, if you have any indication of that the people who are funding this project will actually commit to it long term, or do you think that they'll be looking for some sort of evidence of uh, what's likely to produce in terms of returns before they commit further that's fair enough uh so uh we, we've given it we, we've got our best possible shot because this is the longest investment that epsrc commit to of any potential investment so seven years is a very long period of time for a research council um so we have that stability stability subject to a midterm review by the way um you know uh, but but it we have that critical mass hopefully in place for that duration and then in terms of how you sustain it um, it's all about trying to make best use of all of the other opportunities that come between now and the end of that project and and we've already as I pointed out in the talk done quite a lot of good work um, building collaborations across different academic partners and across um, different academic and industry uh, collaborations to to lever funds from the same funder but just out of different pots uh, and also uh, what I didn't mention is is a series of other really important um, investments say from the Innovate UK um, point of view so these sorts of funds which help us to commercialize technologies and and some funds that have been derived through through the catapults as, as well so it is really about building um building up from the base of sustain into a very large portfolio of projects and it would have to be very large that ambition has to be high because the number of challenges as anybody who's familiar with the steel industry would know is just so vast that it needs to be so it's about identifying these complementary funding sources and making best use of the community that we have to ensure that we've got a strong sustainable future but if you start without that thing to hang it off it becomes very very difficult to keep that momentum up um, and hopefully that's what sustainability deliver all right thank you very much cameron for being with us tonight thank you very much for giving us a very uh broad but thought-broken presentation uh, i'd like to hand over to mark tomlinson to give a formal vote of thanks all right thank you and uh and Thank you to, to Cameron on behalf of uh, all of us who've, uh, who've watched this evening. Um, I thought it was a, a, a great explanation of the, uh, the many tentacled beast that is the Sustain project. Um, and, and I was particularly impressed by the, the, the sheer breadth of activity going on. Uh, I, I think it, it's, uh, it, it's really interesting to see that, uh, that people are addressing a, a a truly full life cycle uh, assessment uh, for for carbon accounting and for the improvement of uh, of a foundation industry like steel. Um, I saw that uh, your, your two main strands were uh, smart processing and, and carbon neutral steel making, um, and uh, I I think they are uh, key in providing a, a joint economic and environmental benefit. To, uh, to the activity you're, you're uh, undertaking. 
Uh, and also good to see that they're underpinned by uh, improvements in, in data handling and in the, uh, and the, the interconnectedness of, of supply chains. So um, I thought another point that was really interesting uh, was also uh, a, a wider definition of sustainability. And I guess that's the, the sustainability of the workforce uh, and, and of encouraging new people in there. Uh, we're often guilty of looking at the other end of the uh, of the career path within within SMEA, but uh, it's great to see encouragement for people uh, coming into the field. So uh, thank you very much on behalf of everyone. Uh, we do have a small gift which will be on its way to you. Um, I'm afraid it, it's uh, it's not a product of the circular economy. It is uh, it is brand new, <laughs> but uh, you can be rest assured that it's. Uh, the efficiency of its embodied carbon uh, improves every time you fill it up. So. Yeah, I'll just use it for like 50 years and then I'm sure it'll pay itself off. Uh, that, <laughs> thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you for the for the invite. And um, I really enjoyed the opportunity and, and having the opportunity to talk to you. It's, it's a shame we don't get to now have a bit of a mingle and, and have a chat. Um, but, you know, that time will come. Um, and if anybody can remember anything from this talk by the time we're all allowed to talk to each other face to face, I think more than happy to do that when the opportunity presents itself and, and, and more than happy to come back and talk to you about one thing in more detail which would also be nice. So.